how's everybody doing? And I want to welcome welcome you to another Freedom School. Uh, this particular week in these this particular series of Freedom School uh, offerings from the Department of Africana Studies at Georgia State University is dedicated to the celebration and commemoration of the 30 year anniversary since the Georgia State student sit in uh, the, that ushered our department into existence. And we say beyond that even kind of ch helped change the face of Georgia State University. Uh, I'm Dr. Akinyele Umoja. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Africana Studies and form, former chair. And um, we're blessed uh, to have some of our alumni, I would say, I'll say illustrious alumni. I've heard that uh, adjective used before, and I, I think it certainly applies to the individuals that are on this panel. Um, the individuals on this panel are, most of them are my former students. Um, some of them are some of the earliest graduates of our BA program. Uh, some of them were members of the Sankofa Society. So they're all uh, special people in the history of this department. Uh, beyond what they're gonna talk about tonight, they're gonna talk about tonight, I've, I've just kind of popularly said they're gonna talk about what you do with an Africana studies or a black studies major. That used to always be the question that would be asked back in the day. Uh, the, the department, actually, the office said they will be talking about applying Africana studies, how it's applied, because all of them in their work apply some of the principles. And when I say their work, their careers today. Um, so we just want them to talk a little bit. We have some of our students. Uh, I see a couple of alumni. Right? I see former staff people. Um, we, I see uh, faculty members and definitely students. So we want them to talk about their experiences while they were at Georgia State, experiences with the department and how what they're doing today and how that benefits, uh, how the education they receive in our department benefit uh, the work that they're doing today. And I'm, I'm gonna introduce each and every one of them, let you know who they are. Um, number one, uh, we have Kokai, AKA Kenny, or it's Kenny, AKA Kokai, you know, he, he known by several names. That's, that's uh, the Instagram name. Got right? IDs and all them names. Uh, Kokai Stalins. Um, Kokai is the associate director of TRIO programs. And uh, he's done a lot of work with young people in the metropolitan Atlanta area. Um, something, I, you know, we always saw that he would be great at doing, and he's doing a great job at that. Uh, so we, we'll bring him on. Um, he, he, graduate, he graduated in 2003. Uh, he's in the class of 2003, and, and uh, believe it or not, he's the baby in the group tonight. Uh, <laughs> it's been a long time since I got called that. 2003, and you know, it's several other things. I have memories about each and every one of these students. Kokai, um, 2004, even after he graduated, went to Ghana. I think he came back and got a history degree. Uh, he was one of the leaders of the Sankofa Society when he was at Georgia State. Uh, next, we have Sean Trotter, and I believe I see his um, his wife, Joanna Trotter, uh, is also on uh, logged into the program. Maybe we could patch her in another time. Uh, uh, Sean is a public health advisor at Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and he's based in Baltimore. Uh, Sean. Uh, was one of the founders of our Sankofa Society. I remember when he was, he and his friend George and Kenyatta Bush and others were in some of those early meetings to try to figure out what that organization was gonna look like. 
Um, I'll introduce Joanna. Maybe she could pass in later on. Uh, Joanna uh, majored in our department. She's now the executive director of global philanthropy at J.P. Morgan Chase, based in Chicago. Uh, you know, she's responsible for Chicago and Minneapolis, St. Paul. I know uh, Joanna left GSU. Uh, she went to UCLA in urban studies. And one of the things I remember about Joanna was they wrote me a letter from that program. They said, you have any other students like her? <laughs> they were so impressed with her that, you know, she she uh, created opportunities for others, which we always want our students to do. Um, uh, Sean and Joanna met at Georgia State and uh, they, um, I forgot the year, they had to put it in the chat uh, where they had the marriage ceremony in um, on the coast of South Carolina. Was it St. Helena? It was one of the, uh, the uh, sea islands, beautiful wedding and beautiful families and have children now. And I, I want to go back to Sean. Sean, I believe it was in... Uh, 2010, I might have the year wrong. He was uh, the college alumni of the year, college of arts and sciences alumni of the year. Um, then we have Heidi Williamson, uh, who's the director of the Hummingbird Black Creative. Uh, uh, Heidi is has a, has um, establish herself and distinguish herself in terms of her her work in health disparities and she's taking that to new levels on her own now but i remember her most from when she was a, a student at gsu um she actually began to do work around reproductive jo uh, justice and did uh, organize one of the largest forms that I could remember on campus, uh, packed out the, the uh, university center. It was standing room only uh, to, for people to hear from uh, Dorothy Roberts, I believe, who was a leader in, in that field during that particular time. Uh, so Heidi, Heidi Williamson, a uh, very powerful and distinguished alumni. When I say distinguished, I'm definitely not saying they're old either. I'm just saying they've done the work. Uh, Camila Pickett uh, now is the co-curator of the Flowers podcast, and we'll ask each person to talk more about themselves. Uh, Camila was the initial Sankofa president. Uh, she left GSU and got a, a master's of public health at Morehouse School of Medicine, and then she went to Georgetown and got a law degree. Uh, she's currently doing, besides this work in terms of her podcast, she's done a lot of work, juvenile justice, particularly with uh, uh, Muslim youth who are within the system. And she's done a tremendous amount of work in social justice in that area. And then last but definitely not least is Tara Warford, uh, currently the chief data officer at the Bell Project. Uh, uh, Tara from my memory, and she was the only one of these alumni who escaped taking classes with me. I used to be mad at her about that, but I forgave her because we now are good friends. But um, Tara uh, was able to do a double major in Africana studies and education, and she was to leave uh, Georgia State go to California and get her PhD in education. The work she's done since then in the uh, public sector around social justice issues has been amazing. And she's now currently working for the Bell Project. Um, I know some of our, and Tara was in, I, I missed some of the classes. Tara's in the class of 99, Tara and, Camila are in, were in our inaugural class, 1999. Their names used to be in, uh, up on the board, but Ms. Retrell's on the call. I think she did so many classes, we ran out of space. 
But Tara and Camila's name were prominently up there. And then the following year, Heidi, uh, Sean, uh, Joanna, um, uh, we want to mention George Childs. At that time, if you mentioned uh, uh, Sean Trotter, you had to mention George Childs, his, his partner in crime. Uh, they were uh, all in the class of 2000. So I want, you know, from your virtual position to salute each and every one of them, I want to thank them for investing in the department and making the choice to become majors. And so um, now I've introduced you all, but um, I want you to all talk about your experience at GSU and your experience as a major in Africana studies. Uh, just don't talk about me too bad because it's being recorded. And I think we'll start with the, uh, by way I introduce you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to, uh, since he's the most, out of the ones who were here, the most recent grad, grads, uh, 2003, we'll go with Kokai first. Well, you know, as always, Bob, I wanna thank you for uh, considering me uh, to even come back and speak. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, I have dedicated, you know, much of my adult life to education. And so, um, and, and, you know, and, I, and a lot of that I got from even working with the department. I actually came into Georgia State as an education major. So I kind of always knew I wanted to be an educator and work with young people. Um, and about three and a half years into my Georgia State life, I picked up a double major, which was African-American studies. Uh, about three and three quarters of my time here to Georgia State, my father said, I don't care about these degrees, you need to get out of school. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so without kind of telling him what was happening, I dropped the education uh, major and just went 100% African-American studies. Uh, and it is still one of the best decisions that I, you know, I believe I've ever made. Um, so um, I used to be the mascot of Georgia State. I, I think that's actually how I met uh, Dr. Emoja because he's an avid sports fan. And I would be at uh, all of the basketball games, uh, running around, acting, acting a fool. Uh, because at the time we didn't have football yet. So, you know, I, I, you know that's all of y'all that's new to, all of y'all current students at Georgia State, they get to go to football games. That's not an experience of anybody on this call. Um, and so we would do those basketball games and uh, Dr. Mojo would, uh, would speak to me often. I was in the athletic department and, you know, we were still at a time where the athletic department would, en would encourage students to take African-American studies classes, maybe because they thought the courses were, you know, pretty easy. Maybe, we, we, I, maybe, we'll see. Um, but either way, taking those courses uh, from Dr. Omoja, from uh, Professor Densu, from Dr. Jones, absolutely changed my life, right? And so um, just kind of creating for me a different way to see the world. Uh, and so from that, I met all kinds of people, built some amazing relationships, um, and was able to kind of do some things on campus that you know, I just know wouldn't have happened otherwise. And so we did a lot of student organizing. Uh, so we were able to kind of pick up on where Brother Sean uh, and, and the Sankofa crew uh, kind of left off uh, T.T. Lyo and some of those other folks that were kind of running the show when we got there. Um, and, you know, from that, we had Sankofa Society kind of got to a different level. We did lots of naming ceremonies uh, through the department, which is where I got the name Kokai and, and, and a few other names. Um, and then eventually we created one of the things that I'm probably most proud about of my time at Georgia State, uh, a separate organization that was called the Real Talk Collective, um, which was not an arm of Sankofa, but just was a, a think tank space that a lot of students uh, at that time kind of credit with kind of giving them some social awakening. So we had a lot of different people from all over campus that would show up there. Professors would sometimes come in, but we, it was just a space where people could talk and ask questions um, there were quite a few Greek letter organization members that were really close to us at that time. And they were in Sankofa Society. And it got to the point where even during their not hazing process, 
they had everybody that was applying, trying to be a Delta, trying to be a, a Kappa, trying to be a <laughs> trying to be a Sigma. They were bringing all of those people into this real talk space, and we were really kind of creating a big dialogue on campus. And so, it's one of the things that I'm most proud of. Uh, I still use some of that energy and effort as I uh, go out into the communities that I work in now. Um, I'm sorry, I feel like I've been talking a long time, but I never said what I do. I uh, work with nonprofits, a lot of different nonprofits, but primarily I work with TRIO programs. So if you've ever heard of Upward Bound or Talent Search or even Student Support Services, SSS, those kinds of programs. Uh, right now, I work with about 800 students and families in Clayton County, South Fulton, and then the Griffin Spalding area. And I pretty much help them kind of navigate life. And so we do a lot of different conversations um, about everything. Uh, and so, Again, I'm, I'm so excited to be on this call. I'm going to be, you know, reaching out to some of these people even when I get off the call, like, hey, like, how can we work together? So, and so I don't know if I answered what I was supposed to answer, but thank y'all for having me here. No, you did. And what you said about connecting with folks, I remember uh, 10 years ago when we did this and Sean came in town and then following it up, he came back and did workshops with some of the students. So, uh, you know, the students who are in the chat, if you hear, see somebody that you want to follow up with and get some information with from, uh, please do that. Uh, I know, uh, I remember one of our graduates told me, independent of contact with us, that Heidi was her mentor and, 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 and helped her prog progress in her field. So, uh, it, you know, that's one of the things we, we want to create. We always wanted to create. Our, uh, so, Sean, why don't you go next? Uh, talk to us about your experience. And as, as Kai did, uh, give us a little bit more depth in, in terms of what you do now than that little brief uh, LinkedIn intro I gave you. <laughs> oh, uh, that LinkedIn intro was good enough. It's one of those things like when you have to talk about yourself, it becomes a little bit of a hard deed to achieve. Um, and anyone who actually knew me back then knew that the department was kind of like my run to cave every day when I was on campus. I think for um, myself and the time that I spent at Georgia State, and let me stress that I loved my time at Georgia State. It was really a very unique time in the sense of both discovering the energy of both the department, but just also who I was, you know, uh, in Atlanta, at that time period, trying to understand exactly what life was going to be like for myself. And I'll be candid in saying that I didn't necessarily look at the long term and try to glean that from my experience in the department. But instead, I was really, you know, you actually just dropped some some mentors there. I was in the light of Heidi. I was in the light of Camila. I was in the light of Kenyatta and all those. And I was just absorbing all that energy from from all of them, on top of the fact of everybody that was in the department at the time, Ms. Ruth Trail, uh, everybody, Dr. Presley, you name it. I was just, you know, in awe of being around you all and really finding that energy that existed in the department and how it made me feel at home. The fact was, at the time, I was not actually an African-American studies major. I was actually a major in psychology, but again, I was hanging out in the African American Studies Department, like re religiously every day. I would just come up there and um, see everybody. Um, and from that, you know, it was that with some other aspect, it was that community sense that also led to some unique opportunities for networking and things of that sort. Um, you connected me with a couple of community organizations that I ended up doing some graphic design work for some other stuff. So it was these little seeds that were being planted in that department that really did, again, help nurture who, my identity and the different types of activities that I got involved in, but also just, you know, made me, you know, start discovering talents and every other piece that, you know, eventually I can say turn into some chief competencies and some skill sets that have helped me throughout my career. Um, and then the other aspect, uh, which ever, other people are, are going to share, is the close connection of the work that we all kind of do. Uh, again, so you connected me to my first internship and my second um, that 
led to some time working on uh, first, you know, community development, but then also health disparities work. And so, um, <laughs> so when Camila went and got her MPH, I, at that time, I was actually doing AmeriCorps and didn't know what an MPH was and then found out afterwards what it was after hearing that she went to Morehouse for it. But then I came to Chicago and got my master's in uh, science and public health. And so it was that, you know, those different connections that actually worked. And even to this day, I still um, have a career that is shaped around addressing health disparities. And so that work from, again, that Metro Atlanta Respite Development Corporation internship that you helped me get has literally been a straight line that has really defined a lot of aspects of my career. Um, and so I'm going to stop there because I think that, you know, again, there's so much talent and so many connections here. And Joanna, by the way, will be coming in. She says she'll come in and just hop on screen with me when she gets here. And so under and the one thing I will add is that it has taken me from the nonprofit sector to the federal sector, in which you see with Joanna has taken her from the nonprofit sector into the public sector. And then there's also entrepreneurship that is uh, some other key areas that we have contributed to. And then lastly, I gotta say, because you mentioned so Sankofa Society. Sankofa Society being a part of that, uh, that, that group that helped bring it from the ground, from an idea to an actual organization inside that, um, inside the university, there are just some key skills that translate into board management and governance, uh, being assigned to any type of review committee that has played out throughout my career, as well as as a program officer in the federal government. It also gives me some keen insight on how I actually review and look at community-based organizations when they apply for federal funding. So I'll stop there and we can have a wider discussion on all these things. But thank you for having us today. Man, I, this whole COVID period, I've been, I can't, the thing I think I'm most told is you forgot to unmute. But anyway, <laughs> you know, I uh, the next two, Heidi and Camila, I remember I was in a meeting with both of them. And, you know, they're, they're alumni at this point. And they, both of them kept on saying, when I had excuses for different things, well, you told us. <laughs> And so it just amazed me that they could remember things I told them decades ago. Uh, but, and both of them, are, you know, I'm very proud of. Heidi, why don't you go next? Hi. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Heidi Williamson. Um, I uh, graduated with Sean and his wife in 2000. Uh, with a um, as a double major in English and African American studies, um, I, um, you know, I I sort of was like Sean. I was a different major, and stumbled upon what I felt college was meant to be in the African American studies department. Right, right? like um, pursuing my English degree was um, what I had agreed with my parents that I would do. I was making the grades, doing the work, but I didn't find a home and community until I got to the African-American studies department. And I think um, when I look at the trajectory of my career, um, the things that sort of stick with me and, and really hold me fast when I think about all the opportunities that I've had um, and even the the doors that have been closed in my life, the things that I hold close to me um, are a couple of realities. Number one, I never had a black teacher until I went and, and got my degree at the African-American studies um, in this department at Georgia State. I'd never had a black male teacher. <laughs> before I came to Georgia State and majored in the African American Studies Department or matriculated with um, Black people kind of in the same sphere. So I was able to not just learn but have um, counterparts where that learning was applied. And then I don't know if you still do it, the requirement of interning in community with organizations that um, are considered social justice nonprofits. That uh, was a, a bug that 
um, and I never forget, I interned for uh, Reverend C.T. Vivian at the Center for Democratic Renewal. I never knew how long lasting that experience would impact my relationship because it began, it was, he was the, um, the, the door that um, allowed me to build bridges and relationships with the civil rights community, um, not just in Atlanta, but across the, the nation. And so um, I left not with a plan to sort of be in social justice or even nonprofits or even being in the political space. Um, but what I found what what I found was I was going into spaces um, that were predominantly white and female and black women were being discounted. And I was going in places that were predominantly black and male and women were being discounted. And I feel like I got to cut my teeth and arm myself with enough um, information, um, uh, uh, community to be able to navigate those spaces and then ultimately find my own path. So um, when it comes to social justice, um, uh, I think, you know, I've done it all organizing, you know, communications, policy, um, you know, organizational leadership. I can't say that that was ever a goal, but what I found was my passion, which was rooted in something that I found that spark when I was in the African-American studies department was if there was an opportunity that I could take and bring other people along, I, I did my best to, to take that opportunity, uh, you know, either self-train or lean on other people, a lot of whom were African-American studies graduates with me like T.T. Lyo um, and a few others uh, to, to um, hone that skill, solidify my skill set. And then once I was able to bring people along who could master that, I, I moved on to something else. My last sort of nine to five was at a think tank in Washington, DC. Um, I think for people who are very big at checking the box and, and looking at the paper resume, it, it, I think, you know, you can consider it sort of the I Ching, you're in the belly of the beast as far as like progressive politics and you can influence a wide array of people. Um, I was, I was miserable though, because when you see how the, when you see how the sausage is really made, um, part of what I walked away with um, was recognizing that my true passion was to create story and narrative that truly reflected my experiences and the experiences of people that look like me. Because at the end of the day, part of how we live our lives is all rooted in story. Whether you're talking about who you're going to vote for on November 8th, what you think of a person who might be on Medicaid, who you think needs bail reform, or what you think is happening in your neighborhood that's raising your taxes or pushing you out, right? It's all rooted in a fictionalized story of a winner, a loser, a, a hero, and a villain. And so I left the Center for American Progress um, with a desire to start my own production firm um, produce films, tell stories, uh, do it through various streams of multimedia, but talk about the issues that I've had such an intimate relationship with in this sort of political sphere for over the last 20 plus years. And uh, I have to say at the moments where I have felt most discombobulated, the one question I have always gone back to was the question when I met Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Umoja, the very first class, he asked us to tell him if we thought, what did we think about this question? Is capitalism the problem or is the problem with capitalism that black people are not on top? That one question, because I was, I was adamant, right? Um, 
if if black people were on top, we could do it better, right? And um, yeah, that's not the answer. But <laughs> at the end of the day, right, holding sort of that question and and recognizing that there is a responsibility, right, in the work that I do, whether it's an artist or a policy analyst, um, I would have never had that balance. I would have never had that uh, that. Um, that foundation or the wherewithal to be able to, to step back, do some self-evaluation, analyze the situation and make a decision that moves forward. But yeah, I love my time. I loved every single minute of it. And anyone who asks me where to go, I tell them where to go. I direct them on exactly how to get there and who they need to speak with. And I will forever be a cheerleader for this department and, and Georgia State. Man, that uh, that that memory is so powerful, uh, uh, and I'm sure there'll be questions later. You know, uh, I, we're gonna at at the uh, top of the hour, we're gonna allow the audience to come in. I'm sure people want to know about you feeling empowered to make that move, uh, uh, and which I think a couple of y'all have. And so that might be a good question to come back to you on. Uh, Camila Pickett, I, again, I think, as I mentioned, she was the first Sankofa president. And she was also not only uh, leading Sankofa, but the Muslim Students Association on campus. Uh, she So she led two major student, active student organizations at that time. Camila, uh, talk to us about your experience at GSU in the department um hey all thank you for having me uh I honestly am like just I am so um I'm really proud of us <laughs> like I'm I'm really proud of y'all like I really am um and I was telling uh, a friend of mine before I was like like these people are amazing y'all are amazing people um and I am I'm good with being in this group right like I'm I'm good with being in this group so I um came to uh the African-American uh, studies department kind of on an opposite trajectory of Heidi like I had never had teachers who were not black um and my immediate um experience before I came to college was being homeschooled for high school. So it was kind of a double whammy when I first stepped into Georgia State because I was like, one, there's a lot of people and two, not a lot of them look like me. Um, and so my first mission was I need to find my people. I need to find some Black people and I need to find some Muslims. And I need to do that like right now. Um, and so I made a beeline to the department um, and was basically like, sign me up. Um, and there wasn't a degree at the time. And um, like most, most regular 17, 18 year olds, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Like I kind of had um, sort of an idea that I wanted to be uh, a professor um, of what I wasn't sure. Um, so I wasn't really 100% sure what I wanted to do but I knew what I wanted to be, right? Like I knew who I wanted to be, but I just wasn't sure how to translate that into a job. Um, and so the department like gave me the flexibility to figure that out, right? So I started off um, with a psychology major because it wasn't a major at the time, um, but I was taking all of the classes and I was like, y'all gonna give me something when I leave. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have all these classes. So you gonna give me a degree. It's not one, but you can give me one. Cause I'm taking all of them at, I mean, at one point I was taking a crazy number of classes, uh, per sem semester, because I was like, I'm taking all of them. You're gonna have to write my name and an asterisk somewhere. Cause I'm, I'm taking everything. Um, and it gave me all of this um, foundation, right? So I took classes about history and culture and like um, economics. And there are all of these things that sort of shaped the way that I would think about 
um, my educational experiences moving forward, but then will also like not limit me in what I thought I could do. So um, I probably was a bit naive and that I was just like, oh yeah, I can apply for any degree anywhere. Why not, right? Uh, and people would ask me like, well, what are you gonna do with those things? Like, how are you going to make those things work? And I was like, well, they'll work because that's what I'm interested in doing, right? Like if I'm interested um, in studying it, then I'll make it work because why would that be a bad thing? Um, so all of those things that I learned and the interactions with the professors and um, having that home base uh, set me up good, right? Uh, because after that, uh, I took a year between finishing undergrad and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I thought I was going to go and get like a master's or a PhD in Africana studies. And I went to a few programs and I'm not going to call any names, but I'm just going to say they were not as impressive as the undergrad program that I had just left. And a couple of people, I, they actually told me that. Right. And so I was like, OK, thank you. Um, and let me just chill for a minute. And I worked for a year. Um, and during that time, I really was noticing um, just some really disturbing things about uh, the health of folks that I was around, right? Um, and I was like, there has to be, there's something that encompasses this. And that's how I found out about public health. It was really about me, like being concerned about something and figuring there has to be some way to do that. Um, I'm not sure what that is, but it turns out it was public health, right? And the first person I went back to to talk about that was Emoja, because I was like, I think I know what I wanna do. Um, I'm not sure how I do this. Uh, and he was like, you should talk to Dr. Rodney at Morehouse School of Medicine. Let me, you know, give you an introduction. You should go do that. Um, and I did, and I was like, yes, this is where I wanna be. Same thing when I decided to go to law school. I was like, I think I wanna do this. Um, this sounds like, you know, not um, something that I'm doing because I'm checking off a box, right? I didn't have any planned out career trajectory. It was literally me being in places, doing something that I loved, seeing that there was another issue that I wanted to like tackle with, and then figuring out what do I need? What the skills do I need in order to do this next thing that I wanna do? Um, at the time I was um, working on the Hill as um, an urban health policy fellow, and I was seeing how the sausage <laughs> was made and it was not uh, enjoyable at all, right? Um, and I was acting as this kind of middle person between really concerned folks, you know, community folks, right? Um, and legislators who, we're not so concerned, right? Um, clearly not if they're sending me, and I just got here, right? If they're sending me to be the middle person to explain why they weren't or, you know, going to do something or couldn't do something. Um, and after that experience, I noticed that the people who were doing the types of things I wanted to do had a law degree. I don't recommend that you go to law school like I did. I literally was just like, I should probably go to law school. Um, there's a test. There's a test. Oh, that test is like a month from now. That's cool. I'm just gonna register, take it, took the test. All right, you know, I applied. I got. I mean, I literally walked my application into Georgetown the day that they were due, and I was like, if I get in, I get in. If I don't, I don't. I got in. And I was like, I guess I'm going to law school. Um, and showed up, <laughs> just kind of like, hey, y'all. Um. <laughs> Let's, let's do this, right? It was not the same experience, but um, I took that spirit with me throughout my education and it has served me well, right? Um, it has made me curious. Um, it has made me bold and like what I wanna do and knowing that I could do it. Um, it has made me a critical thinker um, and being able to think critically about how information is being presented to me, right? Um, investigating further, questioning stuff that is like, you know, stated as fact. 
um, and really interrogating my own framework. Uh, and it serves me well, right? I didn't even think about like all of the student stuff, right? Because I, I feel like you just do stuff um, because of the time something needs to be done. I don't really think about that. But what I do think about a lot um, and what I have told several people, um, including, you know, my brother when he was starting undergrad and I used to bring him around um, the department all the time, right? Like folks thought he was in college uh, because he was just there. I would just drop him off in the department to hang out. Um, I've told my nieces and nephews that something that, you know, Moja told me was like, you know, you have an awesome responsibility to community, right? Um, and being here, being in school doesn't separate you from where you're from, um, but it might put some distance between you and community if you let it, right? Um, and the, the goal is not to let it, right? The academia is as is at its best when it is connected to community, when there is no separation, right? When you remember what you're, why you're doing what you're doing um, and keeping that and having that be my framework has allowed me to do things like, you know, work on the Hill has allowed me to work in nonprofits. Um, it has allowed me to be a creative, um, uh, to do, bail work in community um, and to do racial equity facilitation. Um, it's allowed me to do a lot of things. And I think that it um, it was what I needed, right? Like, I don't know, I don't know that I would be uh, the same person or have the same outlook um, if I didn't have that, that like first stable kind of place to springboard from, right? And if I didn't have all of these amazing people around me who were figuring it out, right? But like in a different type of way, right? Like we were figuring things out, but not because you're just young and you don't know what you wanna do, but like, we know we need to do something meaningful, right? Um, we know we need to do something meaningful. How we do it, what it looks like, is gonna be individual to us. But we're in this together, right? We're we're part of this together. There's no like, I'm trying to be top of the class and I don't want you to have my notes. It's like, no, we're all in this together. We're all doing this together, right? Um, and that is something valuable that you know I tried to take with me to other places. It don't really work like that everywhere, which is um, interesting to find out. But you know, I appreciated it. I will say this too. I'm gonna blame you for something because I think you were the first homeschool student I had, and I, I, you biased me. I thought all homeschool students were like you and your brother. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I, I had, to, I had a rude awakening later on <laughs> that all of them weren't as good as Camila Pickett. <laughs> but man, and so Tara. Uh, the professor who speaks most intimately about you is Dr. Presley. Dr. Presley loves you. Uh, fortunately, she couldn't be here with us tonight, but she wanted, when I told her I was going to invite you, she wanted me to uh, def definitely express the love and respect that she had for you in terms of your work. Uh, in the department in the early day again when we talk about uh these students here they, they were the ones who decided when we first had a major they were going to major in the department and so um except for kokai kokai in, in another generation uh but tara tell us tell us about your experience and um what how was it helpful and, and talk about what you're doing now in more sure. depth than i did okay um, hi, everyone. I just also want to thank for the invite, too. Um, it's really kind of an honor and privilege. I still see African American, my experience in African American Studies program from being the most pivotal and my sort of career path um, and knowledge. And I will please tell Dr. Presley I said hi, but I will share what I always tease her about. Um, two things about Dr. Presley and my experience with Dr. Presley is 
she was one of my biggest advocates about going to graduate school and really pushing me to, I didn't believe that I was PhD worthy. And she very much told me I was. And I think always, you know, when I didn't feel that always really backed me up. And so huge mentor for me. She's also my, um, her class, one of her classes that I took was the only class at Georgia State that I got a B in. I would have had all A's, but Dr. Presley gave me a B. So I always say for um, her mentorship, she was the one class where still I got a B. And so um, she didn't she play. Wrote, <laughs> she wrote GPA a little bit too. Um, but uh, so I'll talk a little bit about my experience. Um, and how I chose African-American studies and then my pathway now. Uh, I think to start with, I actually came to Georgia, St uh, Georgia State a little bit older. So um, I had gone to college. I, I grew up in Georgia, but went to college. I had a scholarship in New York and actually dropped out um, and really felt like I didn't do well in school and sort of failed out on my um, original scholarship. And at the time, I don't know if you know this emotion, but at the time, like started working in nonprofits and got really interested in nonprofits. It was really based on some of my experience of growing up and things I experienced. Um, and I moved back to Georgia uh, when I was about 25 um, and realized I wanted to go back to school. And, and that's I want I needed to come back and um, support some things with my family. And at the time, I really wanted to major in social work um, because social workers had been important to me in my life growing up. And that's kind of some of the work that I thought I was interested in nonprofits that I'd done and started taking classes in social work and um, really didn't like it. Uh, really felt like, and I think I don't even remember which classes to be honest that I took. Uh, so, but they were basically the what I felt like it was really, you know, I didn't have the language at the time, but later did that it was, everything was really sort of taught about as a deficit approach. Um, and it just didn't resurrect with me. And I sort of had this moment of like, oh no, <laughs> what do I do? And just, I don't remember how or, or, you know, the reason I signed up, but the first class I took, and I don't remember the professor's name, was an anthropology class. We went to Sapelo, and it really changed something. It was a light bulb for me where I realized, like, hey, this made more sense. We were talking about people and people's experiences and history, and so I just started taking more classes in African-American studies. At the same time, there wasn't a women's studies department at the time, but I did start taking some classes in the philosophy department around women's studies. Yes, thank you, Dr. Morales. And it just started clicking and I just kept clicking, whereas this actually, African-American studies made more sense for me and that I felt like I was gaining more knowledge on how to really think about systems, how to think about racism, and really centering people's voices on thinking about the system. I didn't, I don't think I could have said of all that then, but as I continued to go through, um, I think that was the light bulb and I realized like I didn't want a degree in social work, it made more sense. And so I actually got a double degree in philosophy and African-American studies. And a lot of my philosophy classes were um, as many as possible I could take that were kind of around women's studies at that time. Um, and, um, you know, I think besides the actual content of the classes, there were a couple of things about African-American studies that also were just what I always wanted from, I, I can't remember who said this, but it was really kind of always what I wanted from a college experience. One, the classes were super challenging. Um, and so I was really pushed and really sort of pushed, the, my frameworks were pushed, how I sort of thought critically was pushed, Camilla said that, like, I felt like it really taught me how to be a critical thinker. Um, also, the folks that I were taking classes with were, um, my peers were just uh, really bright and really wanting to change the world and really engaged. And then the faculty were so supportive. Um, so it was kind of everything I'd ever wanted from a schooling experience and had not really experienced. Um, and so that was pretty amazing. And then as I mentioned, as I was graduating, both Dr. Jones and Dr. Presley um, really did at the time as when I was leaving, I had gotten sort of a research job uh, working in the Department of Education at Georgia State and was working on a big project there. 
and realized I just really enjoyed the research part. Um, and Dr. Jones and Dr. Presley suggested, you know, you should go to graduate school and, you know, this is something you might enjoy. We think it'd be really good. And um, Dr. Presley really sort of even talked to me about the schools and how to think about the programs because I didn't really even know how to think about that uh, or think about where to apply and what to look into it. And there was just so much mentorship given to me, um, which I'm forever grateful for. Um, and then I did apply. And then I went to UCLA, I did my master's and PhD there. Um, quickly did realize that I did love the research. Um, I majored in education, but one of the reasons that I chose UCLA is I was able to do a concentration in race, race and ethnic studies. Um, and so, and I ended up doing education in race and ethnic studies and women's studies. Um, so was in a little bit longer, but just felt like they had a collaborative PhD program um, through those three departments. And during that time, I um, always worked on research projects that generally focused on both race and gender. And then kind of what I mentioned earlier, I think one thing that I was really interested in was just sort of looking at systems and who built systems and who do they work for. So when I was at um, UCLA, I worked on a law, a, a sort of study that we did there uh, I was a research assistant in the African American Studies Department most of the time I was there. And um, during that time, California um, repealed affirmative action. Um, and so that really affected who um, was accepted in the UCs. And so in that African American Studies Department, I was able to lead a big project looking at every single University of California um, that first year that that happened, only 94 uh, Black uh, student, freshman students were admitted into UCLA. And so we did a huge research project that really focused on that. Um, and I loved it. And I both really learned at that time, I liked doing the quantitative, like really crunching the numbers, but also only if I could do the storytelling. So like Heidi, really kind of realized I like the storytelling, but I knew how the numbers and the stories could speak to different people um, and found out you know, that I really had a good framing from that all, which I think came from my training in both African-American studies and women's studies. Like I could tell the story and so build that story very differently than a lot of the folks that were coming out of policy departments, I felt like. Um, and from there, then I did graduate and I stayed in academia for a while. I worked at a think tank. I, I taught at USC and then I worked at a think tank at UCLA for six years and ran a project where we were looking at students in higher education, particularly around community colleges um, and did a lot of interesting th things there of looking at um, certain student groups. Um, and from there realized, I think I had this sort of moment of realization that I loved research, but didn't feel like it really connected enough to community. Um, and that a lot of the things we were producing just were kind of living up there in the university and didn't feel like um, the think tanks I were working with just felt like it kind of would be kept being recycled there. Um, and so I decided to leave academia in I think 2000 and 14, 2012, um, and went and worked for a nonprofit that um, in LA that was a really large nonprofit. And I was hired to really think about collective impact, which was thought it a new thing I'd done and not really worked for nonprofits, but um, I was able to look at all this money, federal, uh, federal funding that was coming into Los Angeles and to help think about how those, that money and dollars could support communities better instead of just sort of being chunked out in different ways. Like how could people think about how it comes together um, and really work together? How could those nonprofits work better together? How could school systems and the different programs that did it? It was really hard work um, and but really sort of exciting to be able to think about that. And also like, I think, you know, this is one of the times where I would come in and often ask just really basic questions, like how are we looking at who this goes to? How are we looking where the dollars go to? How the communities, uh, who are the communities? And I think, you know, those questions just weren't being asked um, in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, that's something I brought. I also, also will say a lot of times, I think 
that I was allowed into that room because I was a white woman and folks didn't realize I was going to ask that question. And so, um, you know, a lot of times I will ask questions around race and folks will be a little bit surprised of like, didn't expect you to bring that. And I do think that's something that, um, you know, I appreciate from my, from my training. And then finally, I'll just quickly say I'm old. So there's lots of trajectories there. But finally, I ended up, um, I left, I did a lot of focus around education, but really found like I look, what I like is not necessarily one area of work. I like really thinking again, I like about different systems. And so three years ago, I left and um, started working for the Bell Project, um, which is really, uh, as a national nonprofit, we, all, we started in 2018. And we're really interesting nonprofit. So we work on the front end of mass incarceration. Our whole, um, our whole mission is focused around cash bail and trying to stop cash bail. We're an interesting nonprofit because we're both service and we're service oriented, but we're also a policy organization. And we're called a project because we're trying to put ourselves out, out of business. Um, so we're trying to shut down cash bail and um, really sort of saying we're only doing this for so long. We're service delivery, so we've um, we posted bail for over 25,000 people across the nation, over $60 million in the last five years. 70% um, are Black, Indigenous, or people of color. And my job is to make sure that we're collecting all the data um, on who we serve, how they do, um, both quantitatively, but then also the stories. And then we package that ways and either like bring up litigation against states um, or work with policymakers or other local advocacy organizations to try to change um, pretrial reform, basically. Man, that's powerful. And each and every one of you, uh, I know there are faculty on the um, watching this also. I hope that we bring you back just to talk about that. The, the work that you're doing now that has a uh, local, national, international significance. And of course, you know, when we talk about bail here in Georgia, I don't know how it is out there. We always see these commercials on so-and-so's for, you know, cash bail, you know, and that you're supposed to be a big, you know, you, you're next to the antichrist if you believe in that. So just, uh, us having our students engaged on some of these issues. And I know both you and Camila deal with that particular issue. Last but not, definitely not least, is Joanna Trotter, formerly known as jo Joanna Barnhart. And uh, uh, I know she is, <laughs> I remember one time I made a mistake of calling them the Barnharts. I think I was speaking <laughs> before audience in Chicago. Sean wanted to beat me up afterwards, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Joanna, talk to us about, as your uh, colleagues have done, uh, fellow alumni, talk to us about your experience. How did you come to Africana Studies? How did you come, uh, you know, how did it help you in terms of what you're doing now? Explain to us what you're doing now. Um, Yep. All right. Well, um, I get the benefit of hearing all of you. And I just, I'm just taken back about, I think our superpower is our ability to be interdisciplinary. You know, it's just like, it's so obvious in all of our careers, how foundational uh, African-American studies was um, by coming with mission, right? And like really paving out a path for ourselves in a mission-based um you know, trajectory that really thinks about all of the intersections that impact our people and our community. So I came to Georgia State. I was a, a little late in the game, too. I actually did a couple years. I'm originally from Portland, Oregon. I always joke, like Malcolm X talks about the wilderness of North America. I came from the wilderness of Portland, Oregon. Not a, not a big Black community there. And, you know, my main draw to come to Atlanta is like, I just want to be around Black people. <laughs> so came to Atlanta to be around Black people. I wanted to come to the Black Mecca. Um, I actually started as a business major, and I think it took me, you know, one quarter to figure out how much of a, not a fit that was for me. I came from a social activist mom, spent her whole career working in nonprofit, leading work around homelessness issues. So, like, the whole ideology around um, 
economics and business just did not sit well with me. So I started, I met George first, uh, started taking some classes at his encouragement and just got hooked. I would say one really foundational um, experience I had in African-American studies was an oral history project I did of Mechanicsville. And it's so interesting. I don't know if anybody, uh, you probably have to be immersed in Chicago to know the the book called Devil in a White City, but it's a pretty well, um, well-published book, well-read book. And it's about Chicago and its development in the World Fair at the same time that there was a serial killer there preying on the women who are coming into the World Fair. Um, there's a HBO series that'll be done starring like Leonardo DiCaprio. Anyway, all that to say, it, it's so interesting how celebrated that book is. But if you think about the history of Mechanicsville, where they were dealing with sort of state-sanctioned eminent domain, where their homes were being taken forcefully in um, lieu of Turner Stadium at the same time as they had several young boys go missing because of the Atlanta child murders. So it's just like this um, sort of these outside forces got me really interested in the state part of it. Like, how is this allowed to happen where folks' homes are forcibly taken? Um, I also just came from a really beautiful, well-designed city, came to Atlanta, no offense to Atlanta, but wondered why we didn't have great transit access or sidewalks or um, why the city was developed in the way it was, or as you think about the urban sprawl of Atlanta as it keeps going further, further out, white flight, et cetera. I was really interested in those topics. So that was really foundational. It like all stems from the mechanics of oral history project. Then that led me into also taking, getting a minor in urban planning. So, you know, I would think that that, to me, public health, urban planning, it's all this sort of natural extension of the work in terms of really thinking interdisciplinary. And I chose my graduate program at UCLA, and I remember talking to Tara and getting some advice from her at the behest of AK, um, of thinking about the different urban planning programs I can get a master's in. And I definitely knew, like, I wasn't on a path to be a bureaucrat at a city hall doing zoning code. So what was exciting about UCLA is that they did have this intersection of urban planning and public policy. Um, so that's where I got my master's. Um, so I really only spent two years in the department, but boy, it was super foundational for me and um, really, I think, put me on a on a, on a a path that I think I've carried through in my entire career. <clears throat> so I spent a couple years at UCLA. I interned at West Hollywood, ran their affordable housing um, inclusionary zoning policy or program. And then I went to PolicyLink, which is a national think tank that looks at equitable development issues. So I spent a few uh, my summer there, and that was really impactful for me. And then Sean and I were still in touch. And so he was finishing his graduate program here in Chicago. Uh, I thought we would be here for a year, let him finish up at DePaul, and we would go somewhere else. Uh, but we've been here ever since. Um, and, you know, my roles in Chicago have really kind of gone from very localized planning and community development to very 30,000 foot like policy work. And so I've spent some time in a community development corporation. Um, I spent about a decade at an organization called the Metropolitan Planning Council, who is working across the Chicago region on sensible growth issues, equitable development. You know, I spent a lot of time trying to convince suburban, suburban mayors why they should do affordable housing, faced a lot of racism in that role. Um, and then I went to the University of Chicago um, and supported their work on neighborhood development planning around the campus. Uh, I didn't last long there because, um, you know, the bureaucracy, I think just the, the history of the university uh, in Chicago was problematic. I thought there was an opportunity to overcome that. Um, I couldn't. Um, and so I ended up in philanthropy. So I um, spent about six years at the community foundation here in Chicago called the Chicago Community Trust. And that was just a, just a monumental um, opportunity for me because we had a CEO change. And in the midst of that, I was sort of put in this position to lead the new strategy for the entire foundation, which was focused on the racial wealth gap. So if you know anything about community foundations, many of them kind of do everything because they're really organized around their donors. You'll see funds that support pets and cats, and you'll see funds working on arts initiatives. And that's really what that foundation was doing was, you know, anything and everything under the sun. And when our new CEO came in, who you all should know now because she now leads Spelman College, um, Helene Gale, the goal was let's get focused. Let's really use our resources to make an impact 
And what we landed on based on the research I had already been doing at the foundation was how do we solve for the racial and ethnic wealth gap in the Chicago region. So I really led the strategy development for that work that was released in 2019. So if you can imagine when COVID hit, we got to sort of hit the ground running. Everything that we documented and talked about around the wealth gap in Chicago just was laid bare because of the pandemic. So what that did was just fuel everything um, that we were doing. And it was interesting because I just happened to be co-investing a lot with J.P. Morgan Chase. <clears throat> we were doing a lot of work around entrepreneurs of color. We were working together around workforce initiatives. And so I, I got the call. And my role now is to lead the global philanthropy team for the Chicago area, which is one of the, the bank and the financial institution's largest markets, as well as covering the work in the Twin Cities. And I will say um, it's only been a year. I know this is not my forever job, but one reason this was attractive to me is because I was spending a lot of time thinking about the wealth gap and trying to think about how we influence banks. And, and my role now is like, I am on assignment to figure out what their internal levers are so that we can be more impactful um, to work with banks. Because often we were, even at the Community Foundation, just dismissed like we didn't know what we were talking about. And so it's really important for me to understand, you know, what the inner workings are and how we can influence change. So I'm in the belly of the beast. I was joking with somebody that I had never worked in the private sector whatsoever. So I went from like zero to 60 very quickly over the last uh, year. And then I would also say it's been really fascinating to do philanthropy in Minneapolis, St. Paul, given everything that has happened in that community over the last two years. So my role is like, how do I quietly support organizations led by people of color who are continually being tapped to teach others how to do racial equity, right? So we're just like, how do I support their work, but also support their leadership and, and thought partnership um, in the Twin Cities? So I'll stop there and see where we want to go with the discussion. So exciting to be here. <clears throat> Baba, you're on mute. <laughs> Josh, but I was saying I'm excited to see y'all here because just seeing you all at different stages of life in your career. I, I didn't teach Tar, but I remember Tar, when I met you, it was we actually had a gathering in the department for the graduates. And I think it must have been the first graduate the graduating class. And so just in seeing you over the years. I think at NCBS National Council of Black Studies conferences, and uh, when I visit LA, uh, meeting your daughter, you know, so uh, just uh, seeing y'all at this stage uh, means a lot to me at this this particular point. I'm gonna invite others if you have questions to put them in, so we can entertain these questions. I'm gonna ask you a few as as people chime in and. Uh, and now, Tar, you came in. Robert, can I just make a quick, quick Go ahead. Go little ahead. ping, ping, ping real quick? So similar to what Joanna just said, you know, and what you're actually saying right now, all of our careers have somehow, Kokai, you're probably the first person out of the department that I have not bumped into in some capacity uh, after being disconnected. So when I was coming up through my career here in Chicago in the field of public health and being charged with various population health. In particular, I, I, I was in um, cancer research for a number of years at Northwestern Medicine and on patient care and clinical trials. But one of my tasks was actually to work on the ACA and also work with faith-based organizations. And so I was getting a lot of material from Heidi's organization related to women's health and a lot of things that she was leading on my desk so frequent and how I had to kind of like think about what she was doing up in the DC area was going to impact uh, what we were what we were doing for our patients here in the city of Chicago, and then I go to DC for a conference um, with faith leaders, and Camila was one of the attendees, and I hadn't seen Camila since we graduated, and so here we were just making all these different connections to where, and then again, Joanna was coming from LA, spending time with Tara, and it was like all of us despite the fact that, first off, I thought we all went in different directions in our career, but there was a major overlap in just what it was 
that we all end up getting sucked back into. I don't, not to say that that's a bad thing, but our careers, despite, you know, leaving different states, going in different directions, there is a very unique overlap that keeps happening with the skill set that honestly started in the African-American Studies Department, but are just our general curiosity and wanting to really have impact on the community and these major health topics. So, and even with Dorothy Roberts coming, what influenced me was going to the bookstore on a corner of Park Place at the time and seeing Killing a Black Body. Mm -hmm. I bought that book and that's what made me go into public health on top of Barnes, um, that made me go into public health. And then when I met Dorothy, it was so hilarious because she and I just started working together and then she started sending me her students. So I started helping Dorothy Roberts students, but it was her book that helped me. And so it's all these unique connections that never broke after leaving the department. We are still connected in some capacity, some type of way that uniquely germinated at Georgia State. So thank you. So I'm proud of all of y'all. <laughs> like you said, Camille, I'm proud of y'all. So, Kokai, I said you were the baby of the group. So, does it, the same uh, type of connections happen with the folks who went to school with you? Absolutely. You know, and it's, it's 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 odd because, like like Sean, like Brother Sean just said, I didn't really know a lot of the the students that were in the department. You know, right before me. Uh, so my introduction was kind of T.T. Lyo, um, Afua, and and some of that that group uh, that that she and Lacey playing. As uh, as we refer to them, um, and so that was kind of my introduction. But after that, you know, I have so many kind of lifelong relationships just from um, the department. And I actually just shared this link on Facebook, so a couple of people have texted me. Um, Kalfani, who is now a PhD at another institution, and a few other people have kind of logged in. Um, and so it's it's amazing the kind of relationships that are built. I said this a little while ago and I wasn't joking. I'm probably going to be reaching out to some of y'all to talk to some of my high school students real soon just because, you know, I'm, I'm so impressed by, you know, the kind of lives and careers that you all have built for yourselves. Um, I, one of the jokes that I always kind of say is I learned a lot at Georgia State. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, a, a, a kid from Augusta, Georgia, and I used to tell people all the time, I don't know what my life would look like if I met AK, if I met Dr. Emoja when I was 13, 14, 15 years old, as opposed to 20 years old. Uh, and so in some of the work that I do, obviously nobody can be uh, Dr. Emoja. So I'm definitely not, a, not, not, not that good at what I do. Um, but I, I do try to give some of those lessons that I learned in the department uh, to the young people that I work with, right? Just to kind of open up their world a little bit earlier uh, than, than the 19, 20, 21 year old awakening that, that you know, myself and, and several of my peers experienced. Um, and so, yeah, the, the relationships are still very much so intact. Um, so much of who I am was kind of forged at Georgia State and specifically in the Department of African American Studies. Uh, and so it's just, a, you know, like I said, it's an honor to be on the call with y'all. Now, uh, Tara, unlike all of these folks, you you were you're not black. So, how was it? How did you choose Africana studies? Not being black, you kind of spoke to that. And then, how has it been for you not being a person of African descent uh, in the department community, and then later with that degree? So. You know, I think uh, I talked a little bit about how I ended up in the department. Um, and, you know, I obviously it's a question that I get asked a lot. Interestingly, I get asked more um, from white folks, which I think is interesting of why African-American studies. Um, and I always just sort of really share that my interest is social justice and it is a different framing from it, but I think it's, um, like I mentioned, the best framing for me and where I really saw versus some of the other places where I think I was suggested to go and do that work. Um, I do think, you know, I, I get asked the questions like, should white students go into African American studies? Does it make sense? Obviously for me, I think, uh, as I mentioned early, it's it was huge for how I look at the issues. Um, and I feel really honored that I was able to be in those classes and to be pushed around some of my thinking. 
um, and continue to be pushed through graduate school. Um, but I also, I'll be honest, like I don't like the question because um, I think a lot of white students joining and going through African American studies or other ethnic studies programs, like, you know, would change those programs. Um, and so to me, it really is important that it's really centered around African American students for African American studies. I also worked a lot with Chicano studies at UCLA um, and I would feel the same way. So it's always a really hard question for me. I feel like it was really important for me, but I also feel like a lot of white students in classes would change those classes. And I'm not sure if that's what I would agree with. So it's a hard answer for me. That's interesting. I, I, I it, was, uh, it made me think of, uh, I remember one time I had a student complain. We mentioned this earlier, uh, Camila and Sean, I think Joanna and, and their friend George took a class from me and they, uh, somebody said, the complaint was I was being influenced by the Afrocentric students in the class. I should have told them to Google me, huh? Did I? I had some thoughts before I met them, <laughs> but anyway, and so Heidi and Camila, uh, you all have kind of shifted modalities in a way, and you talked about that somewhat, but how did you feel empowered enough to do that, uh, to, to be able to decide, okay, I'm gonna move from, I've been establishing my career in this direction, but I wanna move in this direction. How did, how did that, how did you feel empowered enough in, to do that? Did it take a lot of, of you being courageous to do that? Um, no, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things that we're not naming um, and, and part of what I think we also need to celebrate ourselves is um, we're talking about a lot of fields that are white spaces and black people being put into white spaces that are not meant to support them, their leadership, their courses of research or, you know, promotion of their work. Um, when you're in an unhealthy environment and you're not getting the proper support or don't have the proper community supporting you, it can literally make you sick. Mm. And that's what happened to me. Um, and I remember going to um, my director at, at CAP and was like, if I don't leave, I'm going to hurt somebody. This place is racist. I don't care who's in charge. This place is racist. This work is not being valued and I need to go figure a few things out, right? And I think, um, having the clarity to sort of know my limits and know that um, this isn't serving me, even though um, for a long time I thought the ends justified the means. Um, I think um, one of it, it's always good to have uh, mentors and people that you can lean on. And in my case, there were um, Black women and Black men who are affiliated with either the human rights movement or the civil rights movement who could give me perspective on, um, on give me their feedback on the way they, the way it was framed to me, the way young folks do leadership. And when I thought about how people saw me, but how I saw myself and recognizing that as a leader, I had a responsibility, not just to everybody that I wanted to help, but also to myself and that in and of itself can be a service. Um, I got back to the basics. I got back to the things that I knew made me happy. Um, and part of that is truly, um, like I said, if I'm gonna craft a story that's gonna be a national message it you best believe is not going to harm black women and and black families right and so the reality is part of what i'm doing is an extension of what i was already doing i changed location and i created parameters that benefited me now that doesn't mean that there was no strategy attached to it that doesn't mean that there wasn't um 
a commitment to to sort of educate myself into the place that I was going. I went to I got my master's at American University, which um, you know was for mid career professionals. So it was film school, but for people who were transitioning from one field to another, because I knew I had as Sean said, competencies and skill sets, but I needed help understanding what was transferable. And when I actually had to sit down, talk to people who had, you know, I had professors who were Academy Award winning writers, you know, sound people um, and recognize, okay, so I'm starting this new career, but that doesn't mean I'm starting from scratch. I'm, I'm pivoting. And these sets of skills are transferable. Let me lean into that to, to sort of make sure I'm stable because we're not 25 years old with no debt and responsibilities. I can't, you know, do the whole, you know, be broke and, and the art will come. That that that's not a that's not a reality. So yeah, and and I just made a plan, worked the plan and yeah, I think being true to yourself and sort of understanding where you sit. Now, I have to say, it wasn't until I was at Georgia State, which is in downtown Atlanta, that was my first introduction of what it meant to see and be in a world where Blackness was centered. So taking that sort of platform, plus all of my experiences that came came after that. Um, yeah, I, I'll tell anybody, you need to contact me because my specialty, yeah, you can look at the expertise that all the other people say that I have, but my specialty, my expertise is centering the voices and experiences of Black women. So I, I'll die on that hill any day because I know, how to cre I know how to create that universe. I know how to center that voice. I've had to do it in policy. I've had to do it, you know, for advocacy. I've had to do it for all of these other people. And it's just about reframing that and pitching yourself in the best way possible. Yeah, I, I, yes. Um, I think for me, um, what was uh, crystallized being at Georgia State um, was that I'm going to be me in any space, right? Like, I'm, this is what you get. <laughs> when I walk into a space, um, I am Black, I'm Muslim, um, and you're going to get that in any space I'm in, right? And it, um, it's part of the way I was raised, um, but it was crystallized there that I can take that anywhere I go, Right. Um, and if at any point um, I get pushed back from that or um, that is sort of minimized, um, it's not going to be the space for me, right? So I can either find something else, I can craft it differently. Um, and there have been times where I have been the person in the room that has like pushed back against it, pushed back against it, right? Um, to be the voice. And then there's been a time where I've been like, you know what? I've been the voice enough. I need to go stop, find somewhere where I don't have to be the only person, right? Where I can I can chill for a bit um, and bring a different type of voice to a space. Um, and so I've had to think about that. Um, and because I am a person of faith, um, I feel like I have to I have to go where my spirit feels good. Um, and at every turn that I have ignored that and tried to push against that and be somewhere or like think that I needed to be on a different trajectory and like, like really, really wanted to do it. My plan uh, when I went to law school was to be a public defender. That's really what I wanted to do. Um, and I spent my summers um, interning and with, you know, judges and doing um, public defense internships. That's what I wanted to do. That was my trajectory. Uh, and it didn't happen. Like the first interview I had, I was like super excited. Um, and, you know, public defenders don't get paid a lot. Um, people don't really leave those positions in good offices, right? So it was like, 
one office had two spots and there were like, you know, 30 people applying for it and everybody had more experience than me. Um, and so I was going to these interviews and I was just feeling completely, you know, demoralized. Like, did I, did I incur all of this awesome debt, you know, to not do the thing that I want to do? And the answer was, yes, girl, you did. That's exactly what you did. You went and incurred all this debt to not do the thing that you thought you wanted to do. Right. And that's a blow. Um, but it was also like, okay, there's clearly something you you can do though, right? You didn't do it for nothing. You did it for something. Um, and so trying to stick myself into places where I thought I needed to be um, wasn't working um, because either it, it wasn't working because I wasn't able to come to the space and be all of me, right? Like I was going on interviews and it was kind of like, oh, you know, We've, we've, we've been talking to you now for 30 minutes and we've looked at all of this. Do you think you're going to be able to be like aggressive enough as a Muslim woman, right? And it's like, have we been talking for 30 minutes or not? Like, I don't, what, what is this? Or do you think you're going to be able to do this thing? Or is this going to be a problem? Or that going to be a problem, right? Um, and I had to, I had to step back um, and go back to, who I want to be, right? Not what I want to do necessarily, um, but who I want to be as a person. Um, and then also think think really critically about what that was going to mean for my career trajectory, right? Um, and if I needed to tie my job with my identity that closely. If I could just have a job, there's a job to pay back the bills. Um, and then find my passion other places, or if I need the two to be linked. Um, and I decided as long as I could have something that, you know, didn't feel oppressive to me, where I knew I wasn't doing any harm, and I wasn't about to hurt nobody when I went, then I could just have a job, right? Um, and I can do everything that I want to do somewhere else. I can figure that out for myself. That doesn't have to be tied to my ability to pay my bills. Thankfully, um, when I came back to Atlanta, Umoja once again um, hooked me up with my job, right? Like I was like, I'm not sure what I want to do when I'm here. I don't know what I'm going to do when I come back. He was like, you should contact my colleague, Paula Dressel. They're looking for folks, um, you know, to do um, training and facilitating. I was like, yeah, let me do that. Um, and I've been doing that now since 2016 and I really love it. And it allows me to bring everything that I know, um, and to be who I am. Right. Um, and to, um, help, um, in a way that feels good for me. Um, and I still have the flexibility to do all the other stuff that I want to do, right? So I still have the flexibility to, to write and to do the podcast and to do the bill work and to be all of these things that I'm discovering that I like to be. Um, I have all of that flexibility in that. And I, have, I don't have to like worry about um, some part of me needing to like be minimized or like take a back seat because what I learned about myself and especially now like I'm not gonna say how old I am but I graduated in 1999 so it's not young and I'm I'm my patience with any other thing done right like I don't have the patience anymore <laughs> or the desire or the will to be anywhere where I gotta explain why I'm here like if you don't get it you don't get it and that's fine but I'm gonna keep moving like I move and all of that was crystallized in the African American studies department, right? Because nobody, nobody was like, what's the Muslim girl doing here? Right. Nobody said that. That was never an issue, right? Was I doing Sankofa and MSA? Yeah. Nobody had a problem with that, right? There was no ever, never any like questioning about that. I never had to explain that. It just was, right? Um, and I appreciated that. And it made me like really believe like, yeah, I could do whatever I want in whatever space, just me as me. And that's perfectly good, right? 
Thank I'm you. Muted again. I was going to say that those are great testimonies. I think um, some of what you said, saying, Camila, I, I, I think the spirit of the department, I think modeling the spirit of the city in itself and the demands of the students, they call for opposition to racism, sexism, homophobia. And so uh, our department, I know Dr. Jones, his leadership, he, it was, we were trying to be as diverse as we could be. So it wasn't, uh, we wanted to represent, you know, the type of society we wanted to see. So it wasn't to be exclusionary, you know? And so uh, I think your comments reflect that. Uh, I've, I've held y'all, uh, I actually, uh, when I uh, sent y'all your initial invitation for this, I said, request for your service. And I, I know uh, a couple of y'all are parents and stuff too. I think jo Joanna said that uh, they were going to have divide and conquer <laughs> to deal with the parental responsibilities tonight. So I'm not going to keep you too long. So I just want to ask one you to do one final thing uh, before I make my closing comments. And I want you to, you know, think about what type of message, you know, a couple of minutes, just what type of message do you want to say to today's student? Imagine a student that were like you uh, when you were a freshman or sophomore at GSU. What message are you offering to them? I'm gonna go in order, I guess, to the last. I'll start with Joanna first, and we're gonna go in the order that you, pre uh, reverse order that you presented. So that'll be fine. Um, yeah, no, that's a great, I mean, I think it is a bit scary, you know, thinking about, gosh, am I getting an expertise in something? And I just feel like as, as I've gone further in my career and I've always had a little bit of self-doubt that I didn't like really double down on one specific thing where I'm like the expert, but I, I really have come to the conclusion my superpower is being able, I can work on workforce issues. I can work on, you know, justice issues. I'm at a public safety table. I'm at a, and, and I feel like there's not a lot of my colleagues that know how to do that. Um, and that can feel like they could, you know, ask the right questions, um, learn quickly, and always center the folks we're trying to center. And I would just say that that, that is its own skill set. Um, and I've been able to carry that from African American Studies with me wherever I have gone. So I would just say, like, stay curious, realize that your ability to understand the communities we're trying to serve which is a growing population in the United States. I work at a bank that recognizes that they don't do right. They're going to lose a whole segment of the market, right? Like we are, like my expertise is center in what they're trying to accomplish because of the fact that, you know, we've got a long history in the financial industry of, of doing wrong by the community that's growing them the fastest. So um, I would just say, just lean into that. <laughs> know that that is valued and it should be valued. And if you're not in a space that it's not valued, then you got to move on. And I've had to move on a few times because of that. And I just wanted to like address the question too. Um, there was a question about what it's like to work under strong black leadership. And I would, I would say mm -hmm. I've had both experiences of not so strong black leadership. Um, and, but, but I would also just echo my comment about, um, you know, working with Dr. Gale, who just looked at me and knew I was already doing work in the space. I was able to be set up with the board members to convince the organization in a very subtle way to, to directionally go in a way that could have been very controversial. And I, you know, it was really interesting when she came in. And I remember actually a, a black leader in Chicago saying, gosh, I hope all the donors don't run away now that you got a black woman leading the trust. <laughs> and actually that woman, that like, our investments increased. We were at the tables we were supposed to be at. We led all of the COVID recovery work. I mean, working with a woman like that and, and, and being empowered to lead myself and leaning into my own leadership, I was sort of simultaneously developing the strategic plan for the trust while I was in a really important leadership program that gave me the professional coaching I needed to feel confident in that space. And like, that was just monumental for me. And like, it has just set a course 
for my career that I couldn't have even imagined prior to that. So, so it's a mixed bag. You can have <laughs> either way. Sometimes there's a lot of like competition. There's a lot of holding other people down so that you look good, you know, so I'm not saying it's all peachy king um, that automatically when you have a black leader, it's going to be great. But I have had an experience with an amazing black leader and um, it really just changed my life for that reason. Wow. So, oh man, thank you for that the offering. And and, you, and the person you mentioned, you said she's the president of the Spelman now. Okay. Correct. So we, we Hillary, yeah. yep. We'll drop your name. Tara. I can go quickly. I mean, I think if I think back to those years and then, you know, my, the light bulbs that were going off for me in my African-American studies classes, I think it is just really leaning in to what it is that your gut of whatever brought you to those classes and that feels right in those classes, just to keep leaning in. I think I'm saying the same thing that John said is it's like, what that is is powerful. And at the time, I don't think I fully knew it. I definitely didn't fully understand or know my trajectory and how that was gonna go. But I think leaning into it and then your trajectory will follow if you continue to lean in and say, this is powerful, this is meaningful, where are the right spaces that carry that? Or when can I go into a space and bring that with me because it's not there and I that voice needs to be interjected. Um, and those will open up. I think it is really trusting your gut and trusting the power that's there, that's, that's bringing you there. And that's really the most important thing. Um, and then you can just keep pushing it as you, as you leave African American studies, because you'll find, you'll find your spaces. Thanks for that, Tara. And I'm going to pass the mic to uh, Camila. Um, I would just say, just think more about who you want to be. Um, right? Like you can figure out what you want to do, um, but figure out who, who you want to be. That's probably the biggest um, and hardest task, right? Um, and you can pivot and change um, and grow along the way. Like uh, it's not set in stone, right? Uh, and I think that the department offers enough um, enough richness to give you what you need to do that right um and like you're gonna be somebody's ancestor one day so act accordingly right <laughs> do act accordingly um in the relationships you build um in the work that you do um and the person that you are and uh you know it's great to have a career um and a good job is better to be a happy and whole person right um and so that's that's the goal that's the goal. That, that uh that uh you will want you will be somebody's ancestor act accordingly act accordingly the brother right. who did that a uh, poem titled that his daughter is a major in our department now was one of my students i was just introduced to that so thanks for that man uh, uh, Heidi. Um, I think my uh words of encouragement would, would would mirror Camila's. You know, be bold, right? Like, strive to be the biggest, best version of yourself that you can be, but be flexible in how you get there. It doesn't mean don't plan. It doesn't mean don't budget. It doesn't mean don't consider the needs of the people who are depending on you or in your ecosystem, but you have to be nimble because there are opportunities along the way that are going to um, contribute to that toolbox that ultimately can prepare you for um, that, that final challenge, that thing that you feel like you want more than anything. And then I would say, um, you know, having worked um, with a lot of strong black women um, and other women of color, um, it's been really challenging. Um, it's been good, but it's also been challenging. And, and, it, and I think when I think about the challenges, um, it's because many of the women who 
we deem leaders or who in many instances get that title um, often have been ushered into that position in times of chaos or through a traumatic set of events where they're, they're there and required to clean up a mess that some, some predecessor has created for them. And so um, I think a lot of people's reticence when they hear like, oh, well, you are working in social justice. Oh, you do movement building. Like when you hear some of these words, it triggers um, a lot of negative connotations because unfortunately it's the bad, it's the worst case scenarios that get the public attention and the media attention. But the reality is to be a leader is to be um, in a constant state of learning. It is, an, it is humbling yourself to um, constantly be in collaboration um, and understand the responsibility that comes with um, the role that you are playing either indirectly or directly, because with that comes, um, you, you, you have to be accountable, right? That's that at the core is what is required. And um, I, I ask that people not shy away from that because particularly black women are not necessarily going to always find the support that they need or that they want. But that doesn't mean that you don't step up, right? Um, there's a saying that um, only the qualified are called. And what I have found in my experience is that the, the called are ultimately qualified. Um, you, you have to be open, though. You have to be willing to lean on people who might have experience um, and wisdom that you have not yet gained. Um, and adapt, be adaptable with that information based on your circumstances. So that's all I got. <laughs> hey, that's, some, that's powerful. That's some good work. We're going to have a church up in here, or we have a church. <laughs> so with that being said, uh, my, uh, my good brother, Sean Trotter. So if I had a message to my... <laughs> other self uh, back then, um, it would be two things. Uh, first and foremost, um, stay curious. Um, and and the, the, what you need to really push yourself and address some of your fears, um, you know, go for it, go for it. And the reason why I'm saying this is because in the time where my career tra trajectory has put me in very elite institutions and what i have seen at being at a northwestern and university of chicago environment and you know when i had to travel to all these major universities and engage with students in particular i discovered that they were no different or smarter than me on any inkling of the issues when it came to it, that not to, this is not to undermine Georgia State in any capacity, but I was under the delusion that I could never get into any of these institutions that I have now lectured at. Um, and so that's the first thing is that don't, don't undercut yourself more than anything. Second, that curiosity is what actually leads to discoveries. And while the question, I, I, I love that question that was asked about the black leaders. I have had the fortunate pleasure of being around some of the most top ranked scientists who ironically have been written about in National Geographic as being one of the top geniuses in the 100 years of, of, our, of our nation. And so we're talking about people who are making discoveries that Candidly, we don't initially have access to. Um, and yes, I agree wholeheartedly with a lot of what has been said that sometimes being in these environments can be so soul sucking and everything else. But I'm, I needed to have those experience and actually make sure I sat at the table with those individuals because I've noticed about those places that they can easily keep us out. They can easily keep us out. And so I've had the luxury of saying, being in a position of making sure that I've been a voice at those tables. 
Um, and that's actually what led me to the federal government, because when I was at the university, I was seeing you, you, everyone here knows we're all seeing these DEI, DNI, all these different strategies go forward. But I tell you now, some of the biggest institutions where the resources are going to are still the institutions that won't show up on your block. And so when I went to the federal government, it was with the intention of getting a hold of those resources to actually say, wait, let me read that proposal and see just how authentic this relationship is. And now, because I was on that other side, I can read it and be like, uh, we want to score this one low and make sure that this researcher does not necessarily get this funding as they want to without first showing us an authentic relationship. So be a leader. So the other part of that aspect is what it's like to actually be a Black leader in those spaces. And I have had the luxury of being able to pull those strings, but more importantly, be partners with other Black leaders. Black males in particular, we need to be at the table. We need to be in these discussions and we need to have the education. So along with Haleen that's now at uh, Spelman, my buddy Rick Kittles is now at uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. He's not a vice president of research for that. And so helping to boost their research portfolio. And Rick is an amazing biologist, a geneticist. He's the founder of um, uh, African-American... I don't know, the gene, the gene testing company, he's the one that founded that and worked with Henry Louis Gates for the longest time. But we're there. We are there. And so my to myself and everything, again, stop second guessing your talents. Stop second guessing that a degree is going to make you who you are. It's not going to do that. Again, the question was, what can you do with African-American studies degree? You can continue to be you and excellent. That's what you can do. And that's where I'm going to end. Good word. And, you know, I just to build on that, you know, we ha have different paths, different choices, and uh, different destinies. You know, right. we're not all the same. And that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, uh, so, I, you know, I just just celebrate this. And I'm so, Kokai, what's, what's yeah. your purpose? Yeah. Man, listen, listen, listen. Uh, you let me talk after all these brilliant people, and that's a little intimidating, but it is what it is. Uh, um, I, if I was talking to my younger self, well, let me say this first. Let me commend everybody that's still on this call. Again, I work with uh, pre-college students. I work with a lot, of, a lot of young people, and so I know how hard it is to keep people on a Zoom call for as long as we've been on this Zoom call. So I just want to commend all any students that are left here. I know it's still about 40 people on the call. So I just want to commend y'all. I want to start saying that. But if I was talking to my younger self, um, Heidi said, you know, step up. Um, sorry, I'm on, on my phone. The phone call, a phone call came in. But Heidi said step up. And I believe that's what I would say to myself as well. Um, in my work now, you know, I see myself as a world builder. Uh, I work with, like I said, nearly a thousand families, and I help them envision a world uh, that they have no logical reason to imagine, right? A lot of the families that I work with, they don't have any reason to, to believe in the things that I'm trying to tell them they, they can create for themselves. So I was blessed to, to have been trained in African-American studies. Uh, that training gave me the ability to do exactly that, to imagine a world uh, and to start to build it. You know, I've seen t-shirts now that say slogans like I'm my ancestors wildest dreams and, and that kind of stuff and and I think for me that's kind of what it is I'm out here living just trying to make you know my ancestors proud trying to make uh the people that I'm my ancestor for in the future proud as Camilla said uh so for any of y'all um kind of what I would say is you know keep your paintbrush wet and keep creating if you're not creating start creating um Small raindrops fill lakes, they revive oceans. Uh, so your consistency, even if it's minute, even your small consistency uh, is what will revive the world, right? Uh, so I was fortunate enough to, to get a lot of skills out of the African-American studies department, to gain a lot from my time at Georgia State. But I would just say to any students that are on the call, just be as consistent as possible, even in those small moments, the things that you, find insignificant are going to be the things that one day somebody looks back at and says, you know, the world is a better place because this person did this thing, even though it's small for you, 
um, it, it, it's going to be huge for the world that we live in. And so uh, I, I really look at our department as a family. It was that for me while I was there. I think the first time Dr. Moja met my parents, I introduced him as my Atlanta father. Uh, and so the department has always been that for me. And so I say this anytime I'm back in Georgia State, if there's anybody on this call um, that is a part of my extended family at this point, please feel free to reach out. If there's any way I can never help, I'm always going to be here for you. So, you know, I just want to end on that. Man, I, I just, just on behalf of the department, I would like to thank all of you. Uh, I'm, you know, very proud of each and every one of you. Um, not only because of what you've accomplished in terms of your careers and professional lives, but and not only for who you represent in terms of what do you do for our community right now, but every time I call on each and every one of you, you respond, you know, and you're you're there. Uh, so I really. Uh, see you all and others i don't want nobody mad at me but i see you all as some of the best uh that we produced um and i know you're going to do even greater things as we come to the future our uh undergraduate uh director uh lisa shannon who also majored in africana studies and got her phd in history and now she's a lecturer in the department i'm sure she's going to reach out to you in the future for interacting with our undergraduates and again i mentioned our other faculty i'm uh we got to create some more social uh situations too where y'all you know not necessarily for the public where you get to meet our new faculty because you know i think for some of y'all i think me and i can yell it might be the only ones that's still around from the 90s <laughs> and i i know uh kokai knows dr gales but we have new, new younger faculty now, and I definitely want to, uh, a, a, a faculty who haven't been here as long, let me say that. S some of y'all might be older than some of you, some of them, but uh, uh, but I definitely want to uh, connect y'all with them, and uh, because we just got to continue the relationship that we have, as, as well as with, you know, connecting with other generations of students out of our department. So I want to applaud you again, ask everyone, you know, give you uh, on this thing. We can't give you the virtual thing and, I, and we can't let everybody on mic, but to salute you in their own way. And, you know, really, again, thank you for always being there for us, being there for our department and for you to continue the beautiful work you're doing, because uh, I think you all kind of represent what this department has been about.